And so I'll just give a little introduction of why we're here and then introduce you to each of the panelists and we'll go through the agenda. And I think it's, it's perfect that we're in this space today for this topic because um, really the message I, for me is the power of an organization pursuing a mission that people want to be part of. And at OutThinker, we help companies that want to do big things, help them come up with strategies to do big things. Um, we've done some of that with Heather and we're excited to hear how, how that's progressed. Um, I just want to share a little bit about what we're seeing and then I'll introduce each of the panelists. Um, you, you know, Walmart sees images like this. There's a, there's a picture behind you of a bunch of people holding um, uh, banners saying Walmart equals po poverty. Um, you know, Walmart was pursuing for a long time the same kind of strategy that we were taught. At, I don't know if they're still taught at Wharton Business School, but we were taught at Wharton Business School. Corporations existed for one purpose, which was to maximize shareholder value. And if they maximize shareholder value, somehow everything else will work out. Um, and I think that companies like Walmart are, re are re waking up to the fact that this leads to a limiting strategy, that a better strategy is a strategy where more people benefit by you winning. And when you can create, create that, 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 find that midpoint where you're b maximizing shareholder shareholder value by also benefiting the community, by benefiting society, by benefiting the environment. That is like playing a game where you have no competition. Everyone wants you to win, right? It's like all the fans on your side of the field. And so um, we, there's probably no, pl no sector in the world that is facing as much uh, kind of, sort of ne negative uh, associations as financial services. Really? I would, th yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Uh, maybe uh, yeah, even even yeah, even like uh, yeah, even um, uh, nuclear nuclear energy is a little more popular. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but here we have a group of panelists who are embracing the alternative and showing that there is power in financial services aligning with a force for good. And so what we have selected here is a really. Uh, diverse panel that both talk from that small entrepreneurs, not so small anymore, but that entrepreneurs can make a difference, but also that large companies um, can make a difference. So first we're going to hear from Kamal Kadir. Um, I first met Kamal in Bangladesh, where my, where my, um, where my, my family is from, actually at a MasterCard event. Um, and Kamal, actually, no, we first spoke years ago when he was writing a book about the Re Bangladeshi revolution and he contacted me. Um, and he's, I'll let him talk, but he's doing amazing things in Bangladesh um, using financial services to improve financial inclusion for, for millions and millions of um, people. And uh, Vicky Bindra, who is the president of Asia PAC, basically all of Asia and the Middle East and Africa for MasterCard, um, which is, if not the largest, the fastest growing region. And so one thing that we're really excited about is that MasterCard has really aligned itself closely with this idea of, of being a force for good. And so hopefully Vicky's going to share us some of the impact um, of that. Then we have David Klein. He is the founder or co-founder of Common Bond. I'll let him tell, tell you about that. But he is, is fixing the issue that, they're, that, that investing in education in the form of student loans is actually a very smart, profitable investment. And yet, students have difficulty finding student loans of the, of, of the character that, that they deserve. And so he's helping to, to fix that. And then we have Heather Davis, who is a uh, senior managing director of a group with a very long title. But private markets. Private markets. Sure. Sure. Okay, great. <laughs> private markets, great. So she puts together for TIA Craft, she puts together a very, uh, a, 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 she puts a big fund of private capital that TIA. Um, is, is proprietary um, capital, and she puts it to work, and she's going to share with you that a lot of that is around the mission of profitably serving the mission of solving world hunger, something like that, right? And good, great. And Ryan, uh, we've Fight. only fight. I've, I've written your name a bunch of times, and we've spoken, but I've only called you Ryan. Ryan Fight. He's um, he is the uh, co-founder of Seed Invest, and I'll <coughs> let him tell the story as well. But he's 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 one of the key players behind uh, the Jobs Act, and um, and he is now built a platform that allows the kind of funding of um, startups, and that's another sector that has been broken to now be opened up thanks to new regulation and technology. Um, I also, if you haven't met them yet, I want to introduce you to Charmian Hall. 
Hall. She is heads uh, business development uh, for um, OutThinker. And Michael Froles, who's here, he's going to be also participating in the question area. He um, is also uh, with, with OutThinker and heads our financial service uh, practice. So thank you very much. So what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, try something brand new. We're going to try to do in kind of instead of sitting down and listening to a one-hour keynote, you're going to get to listen to five. 10 minute keynotes right now. And we're gonna do it uh, first with Kamal and we're gonna work our way down here. What I'm gonna ask each of you, each of you to do is to move off to the side and you're going to move off to the side, and then we'll have each each present. It's kind of like we, we're very we, 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 about to really focus on managing the strategic conversation. And so what we find is conversations that first begin with a kind of a monologue where someone can express what they stand for and what they're doing that allows us to more quickly dig into um, the, 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 the really juicy conversation. So this is a way to kind of engineer that. So first I will ask Kamal Kadir to um, stand up. Thank you. Thanks, Kai. We'll, we'll just stand over here. We'll just slide these over here. So we can be part of the... Um, can should we? Um, does it just oh, work? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, I first of all, thanks for the thanks for the introduction, and um, I'm going to talk mostly about two projects, two companies, uh, one in a very small size. Another is relatively large, and you know I come from a country of 160 million people, so large means it has to be at least a few million people. So the second one is around 12 million people are using it. Uh, the picture, I, I, there's a, I thought about um, before I uh, while I was putting together this slide, I, I, I intentionally picked this picture. It has no title, but I, I, I lived in this country for around 20 years. And when I started working in Bangladesh, what I noticed that people do things without thinking too much. And, and because deep inside you are thinking that something will be taken care of some way. And, and when you think about here, it's pretty much the same thing. It's just the economies and the, uh, the development structures are far more mature. As a result, um, things are often taken care of by system. So in a very stormy day, I mean, we cannot see it very clearly, but it's really stormy. And I saw these guys took a boat crossing the Ganges without any life jacket, without anything, because the customer at the end of the day is thinking somehow the system will take care of it. <laughs> and, and I thought, that's interesting, because the client actually wants you to take care of everything. They just want to go on the other side of the river. How you want to go, that's your problem. Okay? And as an entrepreneur, it's our job to solve the the inner problem and the outer problems. So I thought that way this picture is suits pretty well. Well, hopefully the next pictures will be a little more clear. And sorry, Chief. I can See, use. I have this habit of just turning it off. So okay. It. Great, great. I I met this guy in 2004, 2005. So. I was in Bangladesh. I, 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 live in, in, I lived in Cambridge at that time, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Went to Bangladesh, trying to cross a river. And I saw this guy trying to sell this fish to me. And I said, how much? He said, 6,000 taka, around $100. So I said, all right. I mean, I cannot eat a fish of this size myself. And I was living alone. And <laughs> an hour later, the guy came back. And while he was doing all this thing, he was constantly talking over the phone. And he came back and he said, you know, 50% discount. <laughs> I said, I haven't done anything yet. So and then he came back. I said, no, thank you. And we, were, we started chit-chatting a little bit. And then he came back and said, you know, in 2,000 taka, which is basically almost 70% discount. And that's by the time it was like 6.30 PM. And I was intrigued. And I said, what's really going on? He said, well, no, after, after 7.30 PM, there's no, there, is no, um, there is no price for this, this fish. And I said, OK, so what do you do? He said, well, I buy this fish from local fishermen, and then I sell it to people like you. Mm -hmm. And so if I, if I don't sell it to people like you today, I'm going to sell somebody at 1,000 taka at a loss. And the fish looked fresh. 
he's talking over the phone all the time. And I mean, it was not one of those aha moment, but it is somewhat like, huh, he has a phone, he's talking, he's somewhat sophisticated, he can talk, he can negotiate well. So why can't he sell his fish at a fresh, at, at a proper price? And, and that's what I, I, I have this little, I mean, you cannot read it, but I'm going to tell you. Each and every mobile phone, even the $10 mobile phone, has more processing power than the computer NASA used in 1969 when man went to moon. So in that way, in today's Bangladesh, there are 100 million NASA computers in people's, people's pocket. And what do you do with this thing? I mean, every, every cheap little phone has a screen, has keyboard, has wireless by default. <coughs> so it's more powerful in some way than a laptop. <coughs> so can we do something with this thing? That was the genesis of this idea. So basically, there are 100 million mobile phones. If 1% of those mobile phone users are fishermen, we have 1 million fishermen with mobile phones. And if 1% of them, I'm, I'm being ultra conservative, if 1% of them use their phone to do something you know, to post as fish or something in the market, then we'll have 10,000 big fish every, every day. So that was the idea of creating a company called Cell Buzzer back in 2005. And what we saw within two years, we had 4.5 million users who are using SMS, very rudimentary technology, to post whatever item they can <coughs> post on the, in, a, in a platform. It's like Craigslist over the mobile phone. Okay. And when we created <coughs> that, we saw somebody posted an oil tanker. <laughs> somebody posted an Alsatian and German Shepherd dog. And people posted red chili. In total, around 4.5 million people by 2008. Okay. So um, the reason I shared this story, what it shows that people are actually ready to adopt new technologies if we, if we can design it properly for them. Okay, and, and so that is the end of the story, <coughs> except one thing is that one challenge I was facing, there was no payment mechanism. It's like Craigslist. People are coming, meeting each other, and then sorting it out. But it would be nice to have a payment arrangement. That was the genesis of the next idea. <coughs> so Bangladesh has marketplace like this. It's not Bangladesh alone. I mean, any developing countries is, is, is any developing countries like this. And there are apparently $64 billion of domestic remittance taking place from people's pocket to um, you know, one pocket to another pocket. The government spends more than $50 million every year just to print the, the notes, the bills. Okay. So I was thinking if there's a way to combine this uh, people, everybody having a NASA computer in their pocket and digital finance, if we can somehow put it together, then we can have a cashless society. And things like that already started happening in Kenya in a very meaningful way. It, this thing has started, many people have started this kind of things, but proper execution actually took place in Kenya in a very neat way. Okay? So I actually went to Africa to learn about this thing, what's really going on. And meanwhile, my, uh, in while the central bank in Bangladesh started looking at it very carefully and clearly. And I emphasize on this thing that clear thinking of a regulator when you're working on financial service like this is very, very important, as you know all. So what they have identified, that there are three players here. Customer has their own handset. They made an investment of buying the handset. And, and mobile operator, they carry the network. They are the network provider. And at the end of the day, the bank should be the custodian of the public money uh, in the way mobile money works, and I'm assu I assume everybody understands it by now, it has become a global phenomenon almost. But in a very simple way, it's like the way we use ATM. We go to an ATM machine, we put a card, we put the PIN number, the PIN number, we prove that we are, you know, this is my card, okay? And then we instruct a server to de do debit and credit. And the machine, the robot gives me some cash back or takes the deposit. So, it's a fundamentally the same thing. Instead of a robot like an uh, um, ATM machine, you use a mobile phone to give the instruction to the server. And instead of a robot giving you the cash or taking the cash, a human ATM 
a retail shop takes the money or gives the money. Okay. What we have seen in, in even poor countries like Bangladesh and all over the world, to serve a customer getting into the bank and coming out of the bank, it costs around $2. Okay. Just the leaflet, uh, the carpet, the, you know, the wall, manager's salary, all these kind of things. But the average ticket size that each of those customers use on average in a poor country is around $10. So there's no way the conventional bank can serve this customer. But if you look at the banking law of the country, it always says universal banking facility we are about to provide. But there's no way you can do that. That's why you create all this glass wall, you, you turn on it, air condition, because the poor person immediately knows that he cannot access this place. This is not for him. Okay. So anyway, when we have an elegant regulation like that, we created a company called, um, well, two entity in Bangladesh. One, in the, uh, there's an organization called BRAC. BRAC is the largest developing agency in the world today. They work in 12 countries. They're bigger than Oxfam. They're bigger than Save the Children. Um, they work in 12 countries, started from Bangladesh, around 70,000 employees. So they also have a commercial bank. And company I founded along with a few other like-minded people called Money in Motion, based in the US. These two entities together form this company called Bikash. Bikash is a Sanskrit word. <laughs> Bikash means prosperity. And you know, the regulator always has funny laws. They said the cash cannot be used in branding. So I said, okay, let's pick a word that sounds like cash, but not cash. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we put big cash. It sounds like Bangladesh cash. Or, and at the same time, it sounds like prosperity. So, and we started putting together agent network, uh, like this shop. <coughs> and it says, please be cash here. And when we came to a reasonable shape, after with our seed fund and all this, uh, IFC became an equity partner. So is um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This is their first equity investment in the space of financial inclusion. And today, uh, we have 90,000 such digital agents all over the country, and 12.2 million customer. And um, Bikash is a Bengali verb now. So people say Bikash me, you know, give me money or send me money. Okay. Now, what impact does it make? And Kayan, you told me little more than 10 minutes I can get, so I'm going to allocate that effectively, <laughs> sorry. See, this is an interesting slide. I mean, when we are thinking about because 10, 12 years ago, this is what was exciting me. Uh, I don't know whether you can see, there are red and blue, okay? Red means cash out, blue means cash in. So these are all the districts of the country. So these are the big four districts, Dhaka, Chittagong, uh, Ghazipur and, and, and Naran Ganj. So this is where all the cash in is taking place. So imagine these are all basically the New York, New York, New Jersey, um, places where you can have lots of factories, lots of industries, and the rest of the country is taking the money out. So you put the money in, instantly you take the money out on the other end. Okay? Creates an extremely efficient uh, system of money transfer, and 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 and. Um, and it happens very fast and economic way. It's cost, because Bangladesh is such a big country, uh, you can scale it up and the cost is extremely low. But this is, I mean, uh, I mean, when I first saw it, this graph after doing this funny thing for you know, a year or so, it's, it's one of those emotional moments like, wow, this is so interesting. I mean, I can look at the curve and I can say whether it's raining in Bangladesh or not, okay? Because around 12 million, around, um, we are doing around, million and you know 1.3 million transaction every day if it rains the transaction is going to go down okay so what impact does it create so this is one of my typical user now say i'll give an example of textile because people hear about textile and bangladesh all the time together okay so say if i'm a textile worker i earn my salary and i don't have a place to store it I give it to my husband or my brother or to my, um, uh, you know, my father. And even if they invest the money, even if they have the money and trying to not waste the money or you know, squander it any other way, but they will be using it somewhere. They will be investing it somewhere. They will be going to buy some raw material, try to sell it somewhere. 
So when she needs the money, when she said, I want to send my daughter to school tomorrow, I want to pay her tuition, at that very moment, those, even those good guys will say, oops, I don't have the money with me. Okay? So the empowerment doesn't really take place in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, the way that we want to. And the other thing is, why do people put the money usually under the mattress? Okay? Now, because she's becoming the collective mattress for the whole country. Okay? People put the money in the electronic system. And the last thing is, is again, a personal belief, and, 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 and I'm not a banker, neither am I a financial expert. So, so I, I, these kind of things, I say it without knowing whether uh, I'm saying something really, I mean, profound or not. But, but I really think the moment you start saving, that's when you, that's when you basically start the sign of prosperity starts there. Okay? Mm -hmm. And a system like that allows you to save the money. And you also get interest. Because the whole thing is regulated by the central bank. Any deposit is a, is a deposit. So uh, you, you earn interest. Now, and this is something I'm going to go fast. But this is something I didn't really think about it before I started. Okay? But once we have started it, and now that we have 12.2 million users, 22% of the adults of the country have used this service. And by the way, it's a big country, 160 million people. Okay. I, I, this is more and more is getting clear to me, and that's why I want to share this phenomenon. Is that any use of digital money has a multiplier effect. Okay. And as this guy is sending money to her, she, says she receives 5,000 taka. She cashes out 500 or 1,000, whatever she needs. Her happiness is assured right there. But, you know, I got my money. I can take it out anytime I want. There's 90,000 agents. I can cash out at any moment. Okay. But the remaining money stays in the system. And it stays within the regulation of the central bank in a designated account. And that money is used for other capital opportunities. It's being used to build a factory or to finance a school or finance a hospital. So I think that is a, is a phenomenal thing that I honestly, and it shows my, how naive I am about this, I actually didn't think about it. Uh, I, I thought about it after, after we, we started seeing that, my god, we have such a large capital pool right now. And it is large. Uh, it is large in any scale. Okay. So um, that, I think, is tremendously exciting. I, I think there's a many replicating impact of that, in, in, in whether it's in Bangladesh or in, in, in Brazil or in, in Boston. We can replicate that. Okay. And it all starts with a small little punch. And this is my last slide. And you know, Bangladesh is a country of 160 million people. It's self-sufficient in food. And there are a few interesting data. It has more arable land than Canada does. But it's as big as Wisconsin. Okay. Because Canada's that one little thin uh, layer near the US border, that's where all the people are. Okay. In Bangladesh, everywhere you see uh, millions of people. Okay. So how, do you, how does a country of 160 million people when Wisconsin is self-sufficient in food? Uh, we have more fresh water than the United States because the entire Himalayan water resource passes through Bangladesh. And what it does, it, it, it brings the silt, it nourishes the land, and you grow four crops a year. <coughs> And, and, and I find this little uh, uh, Bikash type service, it's also like that. It's one drop at a time as the water is coming down from the Himalayas. One drop at a time, one dollar, two dollar, three dollar. Uh, and the adults of the country is all contributing. Uh, already, as I said, 22% of the adults are contributing. Uh, and that creates a, a large, large pool of cash which is being used for other macroeconomic activities, which I find very fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. So um, the way we're going to organize it, we're going to have questions after all the presenters go, but it's often good after a, a sort of a monologue is there's one question that everyone has. And so we're going to allow for one question right now. So yes, Gary. Uh, what's the difference between uh, what PayPal does and what eCash does, and can PayPal do that and help all around the world, or are there regulatory impediments? Uh, <coughs> um, I think I can. I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, um, 
If I understand PayPal correctly, you need to tie it up with an existing bank or credit card arrangement. The whole idea of PCAT is because those bank, the people do not have, the people are unbanked people. They do not have an account. Okay. So this is uh, fundamentally, it doesn't have that time capacity with another account. But what it is actually is, is, is nothing different from a bank account, except the KYC is very simple, one page KYC. And because of the ANL CAT risk, um, and, and money laundering and terrorist financing risk, um, the, the activities per account is limited. So you can do right now 25,000 packet worth of activities in a month, which is uh, around $300 per month. But the type of customer base we are uh, targeting, $300 is pretty adequate. Another point to add is like the credit card business, sorry, the credit card gurus are all sitting here, but what I <laughs> understand, that initially there was a limit of whom, or how much transaction you can do, and gradually you increase the bar. And I feel the central bank also will increase the bar when they feel more comfortable here. So what is $25, $300 today, a year from now, it might be $500, five years from now, could be $1,000. That's the, the basic. Right. Thank you. Thanks. We'll take more questions. <laughs> and so next we'll have uh, Vicky, sure. and I'm just going to turn this off. Thank you. Uh, Kahan, I'm still smarting from this attack on financial services. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, firstly, I thought that, you know, should I just keep it short or, but I want to start with the declaration that we're actually a technology company yes. that happens to be in the financial services space. And then I'll talk, talk about it a little bit later. But I think more importantly, I thought, let me stay, set the stage a little bit. Uh, we talked a lot about financial inclusion in the first section with Kamal, and Kamal, thank you. That's a very, very inspiring story. Uh, just in case uh, you know you didn't get as he was speaking, by early next year, they will be much bigger than M-Pesa, and it will be the biggest B2B transfer service in any developing market in the world. And, and that's huge credit to someone who just started this service about three years ago. So, so congratulations and very well done. I think on my side, I think I just want to lay the construct for in, or in financial inclusion and how we look at it, so that then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing about it. So in our minds, financial inclusion is critical or important because it does service in three different ways. One is it empowers consumers. And Kahan spoke about that very, very uh, vividly in, in his, in his uh, discussion. Second is it empowers merchants which are another critical category in the entire system. And third is it empowers society. And let me tell you a little bit about each one. So at a consumer level, you know, fine, you know, we've got a huge number of people who are doing online commerce and very comfortable with things like PayPal and who are very, very active in, in global commerce around the world. The travel, cross-border travel has never been higher around the world. And yet you have nearly half the world's population, 2.5 billion, who are unbanked. Right. How do you get these across the line is, is, is what Kamal is, is working, working through. And at this stage alone today, there are about 62 million people who are looking for humanitarian aid, and only one third of them get it in any, any shape or, or form. If you look at the remittances, you have about 252 million uh, immigrants who are making remittances each year. And for every 10% of per capita remittance increase, it reduces poverty by 3% in that country. Right? So pretty startling numbers. And as, as you look at it, you see the drop-down effect, what Kamal was talking about. You know, it just, just flows down to society very, uh, very effectively. On the merchant side, right? so there are about 500 micro merchants around the world, out of which about 400 odd are in developing markets. Right? They provide roughly 40% of the world's GDP, 60%, 60 to 65% of the world unemployment. Right? So, 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 so pretty critical. Close to 90% of them don't have an ability to either accept payments electronically or make payments electronically. And then if you look at the developing world, nearly 70% of the, the merchants in the developing world need external financing, but don't get it. Right? So that's, that's the world of, of importance of inclusion for the merchant community. And then you talk about society, right? I think the common misnomer is cash is free. Is it really free? So we've done analysis in country after country in just the cost of cash to the central bank and the banking system. So what is the cost to print, store, transfer cash, disperse it to consumers, take it back? It costs roughly anything between 0.8 to 2% of GDP. 
right? So not insignificant in any terms whatsoever. And by the way, this does not include a couple of other costs, right? Last we knew that a credit card payment didn't go for a drug deal across to Mexico, right? So you think of cash, it, it, it sort of really fuels uh, money, money laundering around the world, and not to mention, of course, uh, tax evasion and other sorts of crime events that that cash promotes. So if you look at it from a societal perspective, it's very expensive, and therefore, in our minds, financial inclusion is very critical. So, so you know, how do we fit into this, right? We fit into this because we are essentially, and, and, I'm, and, and I mentioned it passingly, that we are a technology company, but we essentially provide the railroads for money transfer and the intelligence between the money transfer from one place to another. That's really what we do. We don't issue credit cards. We don't, we don't sort of, you know, either book the merchants directly or work with the merchants directly, but we provide the railroads, and then we set the rules for the railroads uh, in, in, as money transfers, and then we also look at sort of how do we ensure that the money transfer is intelligent. So for example, are there, is there enough scoring to figure out which transaction is a fraudulent transaction or, or not? And that's sort of, sort of what we do. So about three or four years back, we sat back and we said, let's look at major flows across the markets. We've already done a fair bit of work in the developed markets. We started looking at developing markets and we saw a large part of the flows were government flows or there were flows that were happening in cash, right? And government flows were typically going as social benefits or other benefits to, to the entire community. And then there were a lot of flows, uh, just as Kamal mentioned, among people that were either just plain P2P or they were transfer for goods and services among merchants. And we try, started to think about how do we get involved in a meaningful way where we can tweak our railroads and tweak our pricing to ensure it's effective and it can make some of this work. I think the advantage we had that because of global scale, that in a lot of times, to provide the railroads even for lower value transactions, our marginal cost is zero. However, there is enough cost that we have to do to build effective systems and security for very different sort of payments than we were used to. Right? So those are the couple of changes that we made. So let me give you a couple of examples as, as to what we did. So we worked about three years ago with the South African Social Services Association. I believe that's the full form of SASA. But really trying to understand how they transfer social security benefits to their consumers. They were having a couple of problems. One is they felt that they didn't have enough places that people could withdraw cash from. Secondly, their issue was that there was a lot of leakage. So there were people who were posing as consumers and taking out money and the leakage was almost close to 30%, right? And we worked with them to figure out a system and quite interestingly, you know, talk about consumer behavior, what came out in our research with a lot of the recipients was, one, they actually, while they liked mobile for money transfer to keep their money longer term, they wanted a bank account and they were convinced a prepaid card is a bank account, right? So not as cheap as, as the solution in Bangladesh, but it's much cheaper than having a bank account and going to a bank and, and going into the branch. So we worked with them to do a biometric efficient prepaid. Why biometric? Because a lot of these people couldn't sign. A lot of the people felt that they were compromised when they had to give out their code or their PIN code to somebody else. Right? So it was a biometric based uh, account. Parallelly, we also worked then with merchants, so we worked with an agency that's working to grow small merchants in the area where people have these cards so that they can use it. In the first two years or so, we now have about 30% of the people who've used it for a non-cash purchase for the first time. Slow, you know, are everybody using it for point of sale just like all of you are? No. But listen, from zero to 30 in about two years, that ain't too bad. And I'll draw out a statistic, right? According to Finscope South Africa 2013 survey, they believe that the MasterCard card for, for social benefits was a primary contributor for growing the bank population from 67% in South Africa to 75%, and it exceeded their goals. Right, so just to give you a sense, small things, it's not as if you're changing the world. Working in partnership with small agencies, with big agencies, trying to see is there a more efficient way for people to find a storage and therefore have the confidence that the money won't get stolen. By the way, just to give you a sense, for most people who are very poor, they have typically about close to 31% of theft 
And theft is typically by family members who steal money from their homes because they know where the cash is. Right? So, so you think about all of the, of the social benefits <coughs> of things like this. Second is, is the state government of Chhattisgarh in India. So this was a government that had a scholarship program in India and again had similar issues. It had a wrong recipient ratio of 23%. And I'll talk about what we did and, and we got to a wrong recipient ratio now of about 6% after 18 months. But the idea was that scholarship money was given to individuals in cash and typically they spent 60 to 65% even before they went for the course. So by the time they went for the course, they had only 30% or so of the money left. So first thing was, how do you protect that? So we worked out a card system with a chip that had two, two spaces, and one space only allowed for fees that would be given to the institution that they were approved for. So they couldn't touch 70% of their money. Only 30% they could withdraw for any other purposes. And again, after 18 months, we've got about 14% of the population that's used a plastic for the first time. By the way, for 75%, this is their only bank account that they have today. Right. Third, I'll end with talking about Syria. So with all of the problems that are happening in Syria, World Food Program came to us and said, we're really having a challenging time in either paying people or transferring food to a lot of the refugees. And we started dimensioning where the refugees were. And a lot of the refugees were around the Lebanese border. You looked at Lebanon and we said that's a very well developed market both for payments and for any services. So you really don't need to transport food, where by the way, close to about 35-40% of food is wasted every year whenever USAID and, and the World Food Program transfers food. Plus, we're saying, you know, they they're not getting any positive inference of being there. I mean, the Lebanese hate the fact that they have so many uh, so many refugees at their doorstep. So we worked with the World Food Program again to create cards, to create reloadable cards for these refugees that were paid on a weekly basis so that if they stayed on in the camp for every week, they had to sign in and they would get talked up for another week. The advantage is then they used that payment at local merchants. So the local merchants actually got some value out of refugees that were there at, at the backyard. And net net sort of a little bit better than just having people who are sitting in your backyard whom you think are, are taking away from your society. So I just thought I'd share these couple of examples. I can go into a lot more details, but the idea is to work with social organizations, to work with government, and now we're working with the regulators in most developing markets, to work with companies like Bcash. Is there something from an international remittance point of view that we can help them? Or is there some other way that we can go by tweaking either the way people think of an account, trying to secure that money in some way, do a mix of mobile and a card in some way that they can have, but really try and ensure that more people enter the financial system feel more secure. Thank you. As before, there's, there's, there's a question that you have that other people also have, kind of, uh, and what, what is that question? Well, that's one question, then we'll on to the next Good, I might get Scott free. <laughs> yes, question. Right. Oh, no. uh, this, this example is, who was the driver? Was it MasterCard having the idea of being the innovator? Yeah. Or was it the government agency looking for a solution? For which one, sorry? Let's for any one of these. Anyway, that's yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I think any one of these, I think it, 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 it was driven by a couple of things. I think it was initiated by us, but not the specific program. It was the idea that we felt we were in most markets, by the way, where there was an anti-American sentiment as to why are payments being managed only by companies like Visa and MasterCard. And we felt that we needed to do something there to be more valuable to society where they could see the benefit of us being a part of their society and not saying, you know, we don't need a, an overseas network, you know, the national networks. So that was the selfish motive for getting there. But as we got into it, I think it became very clear that we have a value proposition that actually we can economically make money of the long term, and the flows were significant for us to do so. So it became a combination, but started more from a selfish perspective on how do we gain more residency in different locales where there's an anti-American sentiment. Yeah, that's a great question. Yes. I'm sure that will come up. Is, uh, who drives the innovation? And is it uh, driven by doing good or, 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 or profitable um, reasons? And kind of our view is that distinction shouldn't exist. Yeah. 
Did you did you have something you wanted to? I well, you said one more question. You had your hand up. Yeah, I was curious how uh, Mastercard is thinking about um, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, and uh, you know, obviously it's very early, but how how, how is Mastercard thinking? About it's for virtual currency. You know, I, I, th I think we, we, we promote virtual currency as a way of making convenience happen at the consumer end. I think where we get concerned about things like, like Bitcoin and the others is if there's no regulation and there's no fundamental discipline to how that value is created, then, then that, is, that is a little bit shady. So we pulled away from Bitcoin much earlier than the others, only because we, we figured that if we were ever questioned by governments, we wouldn't have a good way of show how value was created and how it's transferred. So for us, those are the two things. How is value created and how it's transferred? If you can get a good explanation for that, so we love Facebook credits, for example, yeah. because the value creation is very clear and the transfer is very clear. And those are the two fundamental norms that we keep in place. Got it. So in, right. in a down the line, if it does start to get more regulated and it's a little bit more clear then. Or, or at least if it's specified. So Facebook is not regulated, but it's very it's specified, right? It, the value creation is clear. And I think that's the distinction, really. Thanks. Yeah? Great. Thank you. That's just a little glimpse into the kind of conversation that um, we'll be having in a moment. Where we're, we're going to design this is you're going to get a chance to actually really interact directly with one of these panelists and be part of the conversation. It's one of the reasons we kept this group intentionally um, you know, small enough to have a conversation. So now I'd like to have David Klein from Seed Invest. Common Bond. Oh, we went to school together, so maybe that's the, <laughs> that's the confusion. Um, so my name is David Klein, co-founder and CEO of a company called Common Bond. Um, I think in order to understand what Common Bond is, it makes a lot of sense to, to go back in time to a little over 10 years ago when I, I graduated college. That really is where I think the story began. I ended up teaching English for a year uh, in France. Um, and it was in that year doing something off the beaten track that I, a seed had been planted in my own mind that I was going to go back to the States, work in corporate America for five to ten years, um, pick up a lot of great skills, meet some incredible people along the way, and then go out and start my own thing. Um, I come from a family of entrepreneurs that goes back to my great grandfather in Eastern Europe, and so that was kind of the, the family business, so to speak. Um, I was the black sheep in the family, having worked at places like McKinsey and American Express. Uh, no one had really worked at a company before. I thought it was going to be an important experience for me if I was going to go build a company or a series of companies um, that I thought were worth building. So um, it was in this time, in this five to ten years, that I, was, I became fascinated by two things. One, I became fascinated by the power of education to prevent conflict. Um, and two, I became fascinated with this emerging group of socially minded companies like Tom Shoes and Warby Parker. I love the idea of values driven business. I love the idea that you could have a profitable business model whereby the more profit you made, the more good you did. Um, there was something beautiful to that. Um, and so it was around this time that, that I said, okay, the company that I'm going to start will absolutely have a strong social mission. I knew that before I knew the problem I was going to solve. Um, and so that, that had developed and after about eight to nine years, I had decided to take the leap. Um, I decided to leave corporate America and take the leap actually into business school and use that as an opportunity to incubate and accelerate an idea, uh, build and start a company and run it before graduating. And so long story short, that's what happened. Um, and it happened because I went back to business school. And when I went back to business school, uh, I discovered uh, that it was very expensive. I knew it was going to be expensive. I didn't realize how expensive it was going to be. I knew I was going to take out loans. I didn't realize how expensive loans were going to be. I didn't realize how horrible and complex a process it would be to take out loans. And so it was through that experience that um, really a personal pain point where I, through which I discovered that something had to change as it relates to student loans. Rates were too high, the process was unnecessarily complex, and um, nobody was really there to help you out. And so um, I decided to, to use that experience to take my background in consumer finance at American Express. Um, I, I ended up meeting my co-founders at, at Wharton with complementary backgrounds as well, and we decided to build Common Bond. 
Um, and Common Bond is, uh, right now, a student lending platform uh, committed to making the student lending experience better. And we do that through lower cost rates uh, and a simpler, more human process. Um, for student loans now, we do expect to expand to other asset classes over time. We'd like to be uh, one of the leading, if not the leading, values-driven financial services firm uh, heading into the future. And just to take it back before I get to a few slides, just to take it back to the socially minded company um, <coughs> and using Tom Shoes and, and Warby Parker as two examples that have been uh, huge inspirations to me, we're actually the first company in education and finance to bring the one for one model to bear. So for every degree fully funded on our platform, uh, we fund the education of a student in need abroad for a full year. And we've partnered up with Pencils of Promise, which is an education nonprofit based here in New York, with over 200 schools around the globe uh, in countries like Nicaragua, Guatemala, Laos, and, and Ghana. So that's, that's Common Bond. Um, what I'd like to do now is just share with you a, a few things about the company um, and how it really is the company I wish was, I wished was around when, uh, was around when, when I had to, to take out loans to, to go to school. So uh, we just talked a little bit about this, what Common Bond is. Um, this slide, I think for me, captures the essence of Common Bond. So this is a group of nine of our initial borrowers. Um, as a way of story, we started from Wharton Business School, which is where I met my co-founders. We did a, a beta program. It was a $2.5 million uh, loan program. We had about 40 students and graduates from the business school participate as borrowers. These are nine of, of those 40. This is on the Wharton campus around a love statue. Uh, what I love about this is that it's so antithesis to what we think of when we think of financial services. When we think of financial services, we think of money, we think of commodity. We don't think about <coughs> humanity, we don't think about community. Um, and those are the two things that if we do things right at Common Bond, um, is how we'd like to disrupt financial services. So this slide I put out for, to describe the market. Um, the market in student loans is quite large, it's $1.2 trillion. Um, it's, it's massive and expansive, which I think this image uh, captures. Um, we are focusing at first on grad school debt. Um, we started with MBA degrees. We've since expanded to MBA, law, medical, and engineering. Um, we would expect to expand even more degree programs by the end of this year and more on top of that in, in 2015. This again um, is a little bit of, of how I think we're doing things differently. Uh, so at Common Bond we do say that finance is all about community, not commodity. Um, and here are a few examples of community events that we hold across the country um, from Boston to San Francisco to Chicago to New York to, to parts of, of even Michigan. So we're, we're across the country, we hold events for people inside the Common Bond community um, in order to create conditions for which uh, folks in our community can come together and interact in meaningful ways that in some respect propel their personal professional success. So the lending product we have does that by minimizing the expense line of someone's personal balance sheet. The community that we're developing and the opportunity we're creating for people to connect, uh, we believe is maximizing people's individual top line. Just some momentum. Uh, we are fortunate enough to, well, I'll put it this way, we expect to lend out about $100 million by the end of this year. Uh, we expect that number to be $500 million next year and over a billion uh, in year three. Uh, we expect to have over 1,000 borrowers in our community by the end of this year and close to 20,000 uh, in, in year three as well. We're fortunate in that we have a number of financial backers uh, who have been doing this for a while and are really good at what they do. Um, on the institutional side, we have two venture capital firms, Tribeca Venture Partners based here in New York and Social Plus Capital based in Silicon Valley. And then we have a few individuals um, whose counsel we seek and, and are fortunate for it. One is Vikram Pandit, who used to be CEO of Citigroup. 
The second is Tom Glosser, who used to run Thomson Reuters. Uh, and the third is Tom Kolaris, who's, who used to be uh, the head of private wealth at, at Barclays. One of the things that I'll say on this, and to the extent it's interesting to people, and one of the emerging trends that I see in finance in general, is this convergence of traditional finance with emerging finance. Um, you have, I think, the financial crisis give birth to a divergent set of paths. Um, the traditional path since the financial crisis has been one mired in regulation. Uh, traditional finance has retrenched a lot from uh, what I'll call Main Street finance. So you see a lot of banks pulling out of small business loans. You see a lot of banks pulling out of student loans. Um, you, see, you see at the same time a number of emerging companies that have really come online and to market since 2007, 2008, but really accelerated in the last two to three years to basically um, cover and fill voids where traditional finance has left them. That's what we're doing in student loans. That's what, say, an on-debt capital is doing in small business. And then, of course, you have the lending clubs and prospers of the world that you hear a lot about. And you'll hear more about as they start going public lending club later this year, um, coming in and, and really thinking about personal and consumer finance and disrupting that in a few different ways. Um, so I'll leave it, I'll leave it there um, and, uh, and look forward to any questions you may have. Thanks. Okay, so that's not one question. Is there a clarification question or something that is not clear? Yes. Is your reason for targeting graduate school belief that it's more self-funded by the individuals as opposed to going to the undergraduate, which I would think would have a much larger target market? You're right on both points. So the, the short answer is, uh, for us to have developed a platform from scratch, one of the things that was really important for us is to ensure, um, is to mitigate the risk for the investors on our platform. So we have a two-sided platform of investors and borrowers. Um, in order to be sustainable over time, we've got to show that in these first few years, in years three, four, and five, um, our performance is pristine or very close to pristine. And so we focused on um, on folks who generally have higher earnings potential and employment prospects as the two major drivers of repayment. As we build the platform uh, out that way, uh, we believe we've earned the right to expand further. We also have an opportunity to sophisticate a number of things that we do, whether it's our credit model, our customer acquisition, or the efficiency of our capital raising, which we've seen in the last year and a half efficiencies on all those fronts. Be able to ask more questions, and now we'll have Heather Davis. Okay, thank you, Kaihan. I represent TIAA CREF, um, and for those of you who don't know who we are, um, we began in 1918 when Andrew Carnegie met some of his uh, professors that he had had in school and learned that they were practically destitute and didn't have a way to retire, not only comfortably, but at all. Um, and the reason for this is because, as you probably are aware, academics tend to move around um, during the course of their career, often in search of tenure. And because portable retirement products didn't exist at that time, what was happening is when they moved, they were leaving their retirement savings behind at the institution they were departing. So his genius, um, his genius idea was to create a portable retirement product for these professors, and that's how TIACREF was born. It was TIAA at that time. Um, in 1918, the stock market really wasn't in existence, and so it was strictly um, a fixed income product. Um, and over time, over many years, we added um, CREF, which was the equity part of that. Um, but it was actually very successful and um, for a very long time was a monopoly. Um, but over the, over the years now we're 95 years old and we now manage a half a trillion dollars for over four million people in academia and also we've expanded to other cultural institutions, museums, um, research institutions, hospitals and, and other um, uh, sort of <coughs> socially um, vested uh, enterprises. Um, we're starting to serve K through 12 as well. So um, we have a lot of money to invest, clearly, and, and much of it is invested in what we would call the traditional sources, large fixed income, large equity um, holdings. But I um, am the chief investment officer for a 
somewhat small division of this group that is called private markets. Um, I say it's small, but we're investing $32 billion of this money. And we're investing it in um, some interesting uh, uh, places. Um, one of the features of this population is that they live a great long time, uh, much longer than the average individual. Um, and you know you can attribute that to anything you want. Some of the, some of the things that leap to mind are actually true. Um, you know, it's an educated population who generally knows how to take care of themselves, and they do, and they live fiercely till great ages. And so, what as an investor, which I am and always have been, um, that permits me to make very long bets um, because my my people that I'm investing for are going to live a very long time. And so what we've been able to do over the years has been to build, um, for example, investments in agriculture. Um, in 2007, we had none. Today, we're, we are the largest institutional owner of agriculture properties in the world, and we own them all over the world. And we're using these retirement savings dollars um, to try to solve um, what is an increasing problem about how to feed the world. As everybody's aware, the world is growing. It's growing very rapidly in certain places. Um, there's all sorts of issues about creating a food supply that's um, big enough to sustain this growth. Um, and so we feel that these professors can be part of the solution by investing in um, farmland. And the way we typically do this is that we will buy the farms from the farmer and lease it back to the farmer. Uh, because, you know, I'm not out there on the combine. You know, we have to have somebody to do that. And the best way to do it is typically to have whoever sold it to you continue to operate it. And then they can take that capital and deploy it perhaps into another farm. And sometimes they even sell that farm to us as well. And this is going on now in the United States, of course, but also in Australia, in um, Latin America, and in Eastern Europe. So um, it's a model that we, um, that we think is very good. We've had very good returns for our participants. Um, you know, we're getting investment returns in the 8 to 12 percent range, which compared to what else is going on in our portfolio is actually quite good. Um, but it also is potentially part of the solution. Um, so uh, in addition to that, we are doing things like we're investing in energy, because as this population grows, you know, everybody has their plug-ins and has to have power and, you know, you need to light your homes and so forth. Um, power is becoming increasingly important and needs to grow in increasing su uh, supplies. And so we're investing in not only the infrastructure to, um, to create it as, as in power plants, but also in renewable energy. So windmills and solar and, and geothermal. And we even invest in, you know, methane gas created by piles of trash, um, which actually is a very good source of methane gas. So lots and lots of different ways that you can invest in, um, again, the, the basic materials to serve this growing population. That also applies to timber. Um, we're invested in timber for use in biomass energy, which is not so popular here, but it's very popular in Europe. Um, and so these are, are fast rotation forests of mostly poplar and eucalyptus and species like that where um, you can harvest them routinely and use them to create not only power, as other things as well, but we particularly like the power play because, again, in this world, there's increasing and increasing needs to generate power, and if you can do it in a clean way, you're part of the solution. Um, so let's see, let's see if I have any other notes. We also um, invest in uh, microfinance, so we're making loans to things like the, the cell phone ladies in India. Um, that's a, just one example of, of the, the many kinds of um, microfinance investments we make. But, but there is a whole business for people in India, and, and it happens to be mostly women, um, where if you can, can lend them enough money, and it's not a lot of money, to buy cell phones, then they lend the cell phones out. Uh, they become a lender of cell phones, and that's their business. They lend cell phones. Um, this is really small dollar stuff when you consider, you know, from our perspective, but can make an enormous impact, particularly in the kinds of businesses that, that you're interested in, um, you, that you're involved in. Um, we also, um, because we are a large employer, we have the opportunity to um, use that to benefit 
certain other populations. For example, we have employment programs for veterans. Um, and we also have an employment program that I started myself using our farms um, to employ uh, people with autism and other disabilities, developmental disabilities in farm work. Um, so we have some really nice uh, ranches out west where we have, we have um, teams of people who are on the spectrum, all sorts of places on the spectrum, uh, but they are actually fantastic farmers. Um, and we've seen that they're very dedicated farmers. They show up every day, they work ex exceedingly hard. Once you train them and there's ways to do that in a very effective way that actually benefit the entire population, like putting up signs saying, do this, then this, then this. I mean, that doesn't only help the person on the autism spectrum, that helps everyone. And so what we see is, is this is a terrific team of farm workers, but the rest of the team of the, what we call the neurotypical farm workers perform better as well, because we have these very special um, aids in, right in the, in this case, these are vineyards, um, and we have one large apple orchard where we do this. Um, but, you know, this was an issue for us because what we found was we were getting our labor through work programs, um, work visa programs where people were coming from Latin America, or from basically Mexico, to be part of these programs. And what happened was a number of things. Immigration restriction became tighter, um, and uh, the dollar was uh, down, and um, you know, so they could actually, by the time they you know, got their dollars and went back home, or sent them back home, they weren't worth as much. They were staying home. Uh, they weren't coming. And so we needed a better source of, of you know, or at least a more reliable source of labor that we could count on, notwithstanding what was going on you know, from a foreign exchange uh, perspective or an immigration perspective. And so we developed this group. Uh, they're American citizens. They're desperate for work. Um, because it's very hard to get a job if you're a person who's, you know, somewhere on the spectrum and keep it. Um, and, you know, it's just been this terrific win for us, um, but also, you know, for the community and for the families. So when you're an institution that's, you know, we're 95 on the Fortune 500 list, still, we're still a nonprofit to this day, but you, just, you have a lot of opportunities to, to find ways to do this sort of thing that, you know, you just have to look for them and decide that you want to. So, thank you. Okay, yeah. Is there a question? Yes, please. Yeah, I have a question. So, sure. first of all, I think what you're doing is, is very inspirational. Um, there was a lot of press a couple of weeks ago about a movement led by students, starting with students at Sparkmark, yes. trying to get uh, the trustees to divest of socially responsible yes. investments. And the pushback from the trustees was, you know, to watch. some universities responded and others said, oh, you don't understand. Right. We need to maximize returns. So what do you say to that? That. Mm -hmm. and what are you doing that's different? Because I'm assuming you're still, you're very, you have to deliver. Yeah, we're, we're fully invested for our participants at all times. We do offer what we call social investment funds mm -hmm. where they do screens for that sort of thing. So those types of investments do not get into this fund. So anybody who chooses to invest their money that way can in our company. Um, it's very difficult and when you're trying to run an investment program to have, you know, gangs of students telling you what to buy and sell. I mean, that's not a good strategy, generally. So that's why we create this alternative. Um, and the problem is that I, you know, I, I know, I feel sorry for the investors who responded that way because once you say you, you, you will do that, you will always have to do that and you have lost control of your investment program. And, and that's going to hurt you a bit. The have the option. They opt in to yes, we have several of these buckets of, you know, the pure play, all good, you know, we screen for you investments. And the performance is actually quite good in those. Um, it's just that they're not going to have the energy or they're not going to have, they certainly won't have tobacco firearms or anything like that, but we generally don't invest in those anyway. But, you know, you name it, it's, it we screen for that. And, and that's where you should put your money if you feel strongly about this. Okay. Sorry, I think that, um, just to link back to what we're saying here, I think that a big part of the puzzle is um, the, the shifting in investor composition and being able to attract the right types of investors who care about the value. Um, and Brian is doing some really interesting work in tapping back those investors for a different type of investment. Do I need to do anything to turn the mic no, on? No, it's on. Okay. Is it good? Thank you. Um, 
I think it might be at the back, yeah. There we go. Um, so just just so I can kind of uh, get situated by, by way of background, or just show hands, how many people have heard of equity crowdfunding in this room? Oh, okay, that's actually a pretty good amount. What about uh, the Jobs Act? Okay, all right, so actually pretty good, pretty good showing. So, uh, so Seed Invest is a uh, leading equity crowdfunding platform. Um, we're based in New York City. Uh, and uh, yeah, I thought I'd just start out by giving you a little bit of my background and how kind of Seed Invest came to fruition. And then I'll tell you a little bit more about the Jobs Act, what has actually changed. It sounds like a lot of people are familiar already, which is good. What we're doing at Seed Invest and then kind of where I see the market going and, and why I think it's, uh, it's going to be a very interesting next, uh, next couple years for this industry. Um, does anybody think they know what this, uh, what this uh, is on this chart? Any ideas? Small business lending. This is my, this is actually has to do with my background, so it's probably going to be hard. But uh, so this is actually, this chart shows uh, the stock of Lehman Brothers. And the yellow line shows you when I was there. And then the red line shows you after I left. So, um, it's actually like 95% uh, you know, are squared in terms of the correlation of what happened. So uh, timing's everything. I was really, really fortunate. I, I uh, started a group called Leverage Finance in the investment banking division at Lehman. I left on June 1st, 2007. Literally the next week when I was taking a uh, month off before moving, uh, the first deal, U.S. Food Service, couldn't get syndicated, and literally everything started to kind of fall apart after that. So I was very fortunate in terms of my timing. That's where I started. Um, and then I basically, after Lehman, I went to a, uh, a private equity firm that's based in New York called Wellspring. Uh, we managed about $3 billion investing in middle market companies. And uh, I, I actually had a really good gig. Um, that's me flying private. Uh, we, we flew private most places. And uh, I didn't have a bad gig, you know, pay was, pay was pretty good. I was there for three years. Um, it was very interesting, not a lot of complaints. However, um, when I was at Lehman and even when I was at, this, at my private equity firm, I always just had this, this kind of burning sensation in my, in my gut. And I, and I always kind of wanted to start my own thing and be an entrepreneur. And I got to the point where I was kind of post-MBA on the partner track, but I knew that if I didn't kind of make the jump then, that it would never happen, and I and I'd always regret it, and so I kind of I was the first person, uh, I think, in the history of the fund that was around for about 17 years to actually leave um, without getting fired, and uh, and then I you know started I didn't have the idea at the time. I, these are a couple of the really crappy ideas that I've I kind of had over time. Um, you can see a travel planning site, a uh, uh, food ordering mobile app, and uh, even a hangover cure. So I had all these you know, ideas that I'm, I'm really <laughs> glad I didn't kind of pursue. Um, but I wanted to do something. I didn't have the idea at the time. So you know, I did the next best thing, which was going back to business school. And, uh, and that's kind of where you know, I, I finally found the problem that I was, uh, I was kind of going to solve. And, and this, is, uh, this, is, this was kind of it for me. When I was at, uh, uh, I went back to Warden. And I came across a lot of people like David who, uh, you know, had awesome ideas. Luckily, he 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 was uh, uh, he was able to um, raise pr really good financing from uh, from strong VCs. But he's definitely a uh, rarity, and there are a lot dozens of pretty promising entrepreneurs um, who uh, you know literally because they couldn't raise capital, uh, they threw in the towel before they even got started. And then I also you know just like David found, I, I found this tight knit community of uh, of people who would love to invest a little bit of money to fund people that they know in their community. And at the same time, around 2010, 2011, you had uh, donation cra rewards crowdfunding sites like Kickstarter that were taking off. They've now funded a billion dollars with um, thousands of people basically donating uh, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, 200 bucks to get a product or to kind of have your name in the credits of a movie. And so this emerging trend was happening. <coughs> and uh, I came across uh, two guys back in my second year in, in 2011, one named Woody Neese, another named Jason Best, who had basically looked at what was happening with Kickstarter and thought, why can't we do the same thing with equity? Why can't we raise um, small amounts from lots of people online and give away equity in our companies? And they basically ran into 80-year-old US securities laws. Um, and uh, 
and most people would have kind of you know shunned away at that and they actually came up with this framework to change 80 year old US securities laws took it to uh, DC and and when I came across them it they've been lobbying for about a year um, and uh, in this I mean this chart to me kind of says what the problem is uh, really simply it's that if you look at our country about half of jobs and GDP come from startups and small businesses and despite that about 1% of our savings goes towards uh, goes towards startups and small businesses it largely goes to large public companies um, and so that to me kind of you know says that the system is broken uh, so uh, you know basically uh, in late 2011 I connected with uh, with the guys I mentioned Woody and Jason we ended up getting this uh, this bill um, called HR 2930 the Entrepreneur Access to Capital Act uh, approved in Congress in November 2011 by a vote of 407 to 17 which is pretty miraculous um, uh, in, in this day of age getting a bipartisan vote like that so all of a sudden it had legs and then uh, we ended up getting that rolled into what's now known as the Jobs Act that was signed on April 5th 2012 uh, and so basically um, took the Jobs Act and, uh, and started Seed Invest as a platform to leverage the changes. And I know everyone's familiar with it, but just very high level, the, the really big changes are that um, anybody who, raised, who has raised money historically under what's called Reg D, uh, in Reg D there's about a trillion dollars a year that's raised under Reg D. Almost all private fundraising happens under Reg D. Um, it's uh, a fascinating exemption to having to raise money as a public company, but there are really uh, in my mind two very big uh, restrictions that have been around really since the Great Depression. The first is that um, you cannot generally solicit historically. So if you're raising capital, whether you're a startup or a, a hedge fund or a venture fund, um, you can only raise money from people you have a pre-existing relationship with. So if I was in this room and I was telling you that Seed Invest was raising money and I hadn't met all of you before, that was technically illegal. So um, you're really raising money in a bubble and as a a smaller company that's very, very challenging. Um, and it also has kind of meant historically that you really couldn't leverage the power of the internet because the internet is, is really a public medium. Um, so that has actually changed. Title II of the Jobs Act went into effect September 23rd of last year, and we have hundreds of companies on Seed Invest that are publicly raising capital, they're tweeting about it, they're kind of you know sharing, uh, spreading the word to everyone they know. Um, so we're seeing really interesting things on that side. And then the last piece, Title III, which has not kicked in yet, I'll, I'll kind of revisit it at the end, but it will basically open up um, raising money privately from today, kind of the 1% of the country, to um, 240 million new Americans, so the other 98% of the country. I'll talk about that in a minute, and I'm sure people have questions. But um, So that's the JOBS Act. In terms of Seed Invest, uh, what we really did is we, take, we took what's, been, what's happened privately um, offline <coughs> for you know, 100 years and moved it online. And that's accomplished a couple things. It's A, made things a lot more streamlined. So we really, at Seedinvest, we've made investing in a startup company as easy as buying a share of Microsoft. So um, all the due diligence happens online. And when somebody's ready to make an investment um, in the private world, it can take weeks to, uh, to send out legal docs and get signature pages, uh, fax or mail back to you. It can take. Uh, a lot of time hurt, hurting cats in terms of chasing down checks um, or wires. And so all of that happens in a very streamlined process that could take five minutes in order to, to invest in a private company. Um, and it's also opened it up to a bigger pool of, uh, of investors and companies. So we now have aggregated uh, over the past year and a half um, close to 4,000 accredited investors who are looking to uh, collectively invest about $160 million into startup companies. Um, these are, these are all kind of examples of, uh, you can't see it very well, but companies that we've funded in the past year. And, uh, and in March and April, we did about $6 million of, uh, of funds raised for companies on our platform, which in the startup world is, is pretty meaningful. Um, and it's growing nicely. Uh, this is just an example of a company we, uh, we helped raise capital for um, about two months ago. It's called Virtuix. Um, so some of you, uh, probably heard of uh, Oculus Rift. Oculus Rift is a virtual reality headset. They're acquired by, by Facebook in March for $2 billion. Uh, this company, Virtuix, basically pairs with the Oculus Rift headset so that when you're playing, and you can see the picture here, this was 
uh, demo day in our office. We had the only prototype on the East Coast. And uh, this is a, a, a VC named Luke Kerner who, uh, who came by and he's ba basically is um, playing the video game uh, on the Oculus Rift and instead of using a controller, you're, it's basically a, a, a circular treadmill. So you're moving around, you're controlling everything while you're playing. So it's, I, I, it's pretty incredible um, and, and uh, it has a lot of other applications. And so this company basically uh, came to us in February and then over two months they were able to, to pretty quickly raise uh, $3 million, but a little over half of it came through our platform. Um, and, uh, and it kind of was so successful that people like Mark Cuban came in in the last second and invested 250K and we got a couple venture capital funds in. And, uh, and, and this is all kind of something that would have been very, very difficult offline and it could have taken an, another four to six months to actually uh, complete. So, uh, you know, the, the value that we provide to entrepreneurs is, uh, is uh, help them raise capital but also help them raise capital quickly so that they can focus on what's actually important, which is building their business and, and not fundraising. Um, and then this is, this is pretty new. I haven't actually spoken about this uh, at all publicly, but uh, we actually used our own platform to raise money uh, a month ago. Um, so, you know, we've kind of been, at, been asked by a lot of people over the past year, are you gonna you should use your own platform? Would you ever open it up for investing? So we did just that. We were the first equity crowdfunding platform to publicly um, raise money on, it, on its own platform. So uh, a little over a month ago, we announced that we had raised uh, $2 million of venture capital, uh, venture capital money and that we were opening up the remaining million dollars to, uh, to accredit investors on our platform. And you know, we, ha we, we have a pretty big passion investor base and so we were um, certainly uh, fairly confident that it would work out well, but we were pretty fascinated by how quickly it happened and how many people kind of came out of, uh, out of nowhere um, who were interested in investing. And so uh, in the course of a week, we had uh, about 3,000 people who read about us raising capital in TechCrunch and, and VentureBeat and, and Recode and other publications who visited our, uh, our investment materials. And uh, we ended up raising uh, the, million the additional million dollars in a week. And we ended up being, in about a week and a half, being oversubscribed by a decent amount. And we ended up kind of cutting it off just over $4 million in total. Um, so we had a pretty successful raise. And we used our platform. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I'm obviously a believer that what we're doing is kind of the future of, uh, of investing and, and raising capital for, for earlier stage companies. So it was pretty interesting to go through it ourselves. Um, so what's next? You know, I, I alluded to this earlier, but uh, Today, because of where the, uh, the Title III of the Jobs Act sits, um, it's still accredited investors only. So that means in order to invest in a private company, you need to either have a million dollars in net worth or $200,000 of annual income. And, uh, and so that's about to change in the second half of this year. Basically, uh, the SEC has to issue final rules, at which time it's basically going to be opened up to uh, the other 98% of the country. And uh, the same thing that we're seeing here in the U.S. is also occurring all over the world. So uh, next week, we're actually going to announce the first kind of cross-border um, <coughs> online equity crowdfunding raise. Um, uh, we're partnering with a, uh, a leading platform in uh, Europe. And uh, we're helping a company who's actually generated, uh, in their first six months, they've generated over $5 million of revenue, which is pretty amazing in itself. And uh, we're going to do a, uh, a joint fundraise on a, a European platform and on Seed Invest. So I think that is where things are headed. We'll be the first ones to do it next week. Hopefully, it'll go well. Um, but I, it's much more than just a, a uh, US kind of uh, thing that's occurring. Um, so be happy to you know, talk more about the Jobs Act, equity crowdfunding, any questions people have. Um, but uh, yeah, and, if, and uh, uh, if anybody wants to shoot me an email, we'd love to talk more. It's uh, Ryan at Seed Invest. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you for the overview. Thanks for listening. Thanks, um, could you talk a little bit about differences in regulation in the U.S. versus Europe? Because I was sure. under the impression it's quite different there. It is, yeah, and it's then, great. And then the other thing I thought might tie into the earlier presentation, how are you guys managing the actual payment process? So sure. Do you go through third parties in order to facilitate sure. the money transfer? Yeah, sure. So the first question was, how are the laws different in Europe? Um, Definitely right that they're different. And the second question was, how do we handle payments? Um, so in terms of uh, 
the regulations being different. Um, for example, the platform that we are going to partner with on this fundraise in a week, uh, they actually can, they've been able to, uh, to allow non-accredited investors to invest in companies for about two years. And so in the US, uh, and it's country by country, there's no joint, there's no, it's not um, fluid within Europe. I think it will get there, people are working on it. Um, but within the couple countries that we can do it, they're, they're, it's actually gonna be opened up to anybody in, uh, in the countries in Europe that they operate, whereas in the US it's gonna be uh, credit investors only. So it, it, we, the US actually is pretty far behind um, from countries like Australia and the UK, um, Belgium, et cetera. So um, there are differences. I think everyone's kind of working towards the same goal. Um, our advisors, Woody Neese and Jason Best, who came up with this whole concept, are kind of constantly going country to country, helping them adopt similar laws, so it's getting there. Um, but they are, it are, they are all different. And then in terms of payments, uh, so we basically built our own system. We leveraged some third-party uh, payment networks. But basically, if you go on to, and you want to make an investment, um, you'll sign the legal docs online, and then next step is funding. We basically are integrated with an ACH payment provider so that you enter your checking number and your routing number, and we'll basically uh, uh, pull the money from your account via ACH and deposit it to a uh, third-party escrow account that we set up. And once the deal is successful, the escrow agent will release the money to the uh, company. And we do, we've been, for, since we started, we've been doing our own online KYC and AML, uh, Patriot, Patriot Act, no fact check, so we do all of that pretty seamlessly online throughout the process. Great. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Great. So um, the problem with most, with many strategy processes is that you have this, uh, people don't get to participate in them, and, you, and many companies waste a lot of uh, intellectual capital because they don't get to engage people in really the discussion. So what we want to do, we have 20 minutes left. And so what we're going to do is we're going to ask, and, and, and all the panelists know this ahead of time, we're going to ask the panelists to sit down with a group of about four or five of you, have everyone engage in a conversation, and we're going to give you about 10 minutes to do that, then we ask you to come back, and then that's how we're going to do our panel rather than do a traditional panel. Um, there are a number of questions being asked. Ones that kind of bubble to the top for me are one, a lot of questions around underlying credit quality and underwriting and 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 how we do that. Um, two. Uh, a question around our focus. Uh, so um, we're focusing on grad degrees right now. Um, what is the expectation in terms of being more expansive as, as a model? And then the third piece that came up and that I think is across the board potentially applicable is um, the, the idea of direct mail and how successful it's actually been in the last year or two for a lot of these innovative tech companies um, as, a, as a customer acquisition tool. So um, it's not uh, a secret that Lending Club and Prosper, two platforms you've heard me talk about so far, they're pretty much the peer-to-peer -peer pioneers here in the US. Um, the last year or two, direct mail, if you talk to folks over there, has been one of the most effective customer acquisition channels for them, um, which is fascinating. And you start thinking about well, why that is, and it, probably because direct mail fell out of favor. You don't get a lot of mail these days, and so you have less clutter to compete with. My guess is that this will not be the case in about a year to 18 months. Um, so you can, you can bet we're testing direct mail right now and just seeing if it's going to be effective and see how long that, that ride lasts. I see a lot of heads nodding. It's, it's actually a little bit different in our space. So when Prosper, when let's say Prosper started in 2005, the challenge was let's get li getting liquidity on the platform. So just like all of us, it's a two-sided market. We have investors and we have companies uh, or borrowers. And, and so with Prosper's case, initially it was how do we get liquidity on the platform? That was a challenge. Now that is actually flipped. There's so much liquidity on their platforms that 
the good loans get funded in 10 seconds. And uh, the challenge is finding borrowers. So that's where I've heard the exact same thing from those companies, that it's direct mail that has been working the best, So, which is not something you would have guessed. Um, so. Might share in it all what you're yeah, sure. I, so I, we, we spoke about, I think, two things I can talk about. But the first was similar to, uh, I guess, what, what David's group was talking about, which is how do we vet companies? And so it's actually a great question. Um, we're all about quality and not quantity uh, at Seedinvest. So historically, we've, uh, we've accepted uh, about 3% of uh, all companies who have applied to present to our investors. So. Um, uh, I, I think that kind of trying to be a Craigslist in our space is probably not a winning strategy. So uh, um, the typical deal on our platform is one where uh, a kind of reputable VC fund or angel group has already uh, uh, done their own due diligence, has vetted the company, and is writing a check. Um, but in most cases in the early stage, they're not taking down the entire round. So we're able to actually open up the remainder of the round at the same terms as the VC or the angel group and, op and to kind of our accredited investor base. So that's, and we do our own due diligence as well, but that's kind of how we go about the vetting process. I think two areas that came up. One is we've spoken a lot about financial inclusion in developing markets and what's happening in the US and I'll be participating in any way in, in helping in the US. So that was one question area. And the other, other area was around categories. What are we doing with things like rent uh, in terms of ensuring that that becomes a little more electronic versus being more cash and check for the most part? So those, those are the two areas. I think just briefly on the first one, I said there's a lot of movement in doing stuff in the US. We realize that there's nearly between 20 to 24 percent of the population in the US that's either completely unbanked or severely underbanked. And we worked both with the Social Security Organization as well as Walmart. So in Social Security Organization, starting, I think starting first May or first June, there will be no more checks issued. So it's either a credit to the account or a MasterCard prepaid card is how you're going to get your social card benefits. Um, or, or a mascot, since we've exclusively signed with them. Um, the second one is really with, with respect to Walmart, that all of the casual employees of Walmart, which by the way is 49% of the working population, get paid primarily by a MasterCard prepaid card. So again, a way to ensure that they don't get into credit, uh, sorry, uh, a check cashing mechanism, which is born with a with lot of excess charges as well as crime, and then you get into safeguard. And frankly, if someone has two casual jobs, both of the casual jobs payment can go on to one card. So we're selling it like a bank account to an individual as opposed to a card facility, and, and that's sort of the intellectual shift here. Secondly, in terms of categories, we're actively right now pursuing schools, and then we'll go after places like rent. But the idea is how do you take on uh, sort of places which haven't done electronic payments effectively and then keep going one after the other. So close to 97% of the schools in the US don't accept anything other than cash or check. Um, and out of that, by the way, nearly 40% is just pure cash. So it's not like it's 2% cash. The cash component is, is quite heavy, and we're trying to change that. So. Uh, three things that came in our discussion is uh, how do you raise the capital? and then um, how the distribution uh, works. And the third one is the um, how do you educate customer or the users. Um, our case, um, uh, you know, uh, the raising capital initially, it was, uh, it was uh, the entrepreneurs themselves uh, financed it to some extent. And then a large uh, financial investor like IFC and, and, and eventually uh, patient capital like uh, Gates Foundation invested. Um, we raised around $42 million. And one positive thing I can share out of this that uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, when you do this kind of project in a remote place like Bangladesh, uh, it would have been very difficult to raise $42 million uh, from the US. But I think what we see that there's a there's a uh, there's a more and more recognition. The opportunities are there, and the, as the technologies are intervening, um, there is a tremendous amount of scaling that is possible, uh, and that also attracts uh, investor uh, here. Uh, in terms of distribution, um, somebody said, "Oh, well, it's interesting that I heard 
MasterCard is not a financial service, it's a technology service, and you are saying you're not a financial service, you're a distributor, distribution service, what's really going on? It is a, it is a financial service, uh, but very much emphasized on the distribution, okay? And that's what I meant. Um, but um, the way Coca-Cola is distributed, the way uh, tobacco is distributed, now electronic money is distributed, so we need to sit with that angle. And the third point was how do you educate uh, poor people or people uh, who don't read uh, English uh, in, in, in using this kind of service? My, um, my first point is, is that uh, human brains are very distribu democratically distributed. Uh, so if you can design it properly, okay, and if you can address the pain, uh, people learn very quickly. But still, we should not underestimate the complexity, because when we use telephone to have a conversation with our loved ones, we immediately emotionally get connected to the device. Okay? But when you are doing data transferring, data exchange, uh, it's, there is a certain level of complexity, but that's what we do for, for our living. Uh, that's pretty much what it is. Thanks. So in my group, we talked about two things mostly. Uh, one were more uh, sort of more characteristics of these types of investments that we're making, these alternative investments in agriculture and um, timber. And the second thing we discussed was, so how as a company, particularly a large company, do you stimulate this sort of activity, the creation of these investment vehicles or these sort of movements, as you might say. Um, so on the first one, we talked about uh, the fact that these investments tend to be uncorrelated with practically everything else in anybody's investment portfolio. And we saw that during the downturn as everything else was falling apart. Um, these investments really were humming along. There was no negative mark-to-market -market implications. The returns kept coming in as expected. So um, you know, we thought that was a validation of our investment thesis, which is why we really got into this to begin with. Um, and, and then we thought about it in the context of these changing regulations and the fact that who, people who are now you know, unaccredited will be accredited, um, or we won't care, yeah. um, soon. And the fact that this, this engine that we've built to create these investment opportunities actually exceeds the capacity of our, our general account to invest in them. So the creation of products where you could attract a, a whole new group of investors to, who would probably want to put some money into this uncorrelated space. Um, so that was one angle. And, and then the second thing we talked about was, you know, how do you do this? And, and it's hard. Um, I described TI Cref to you as a mission-driven company that has, you know, what I consider to be very good values. And even given all of that, uh, it took me 10 years to get them to agree to let me build our agricultural investment program. So um, it's hard. And you need to have champions. You know, with respect to the Fruits of Employment program, which I described with the people with autism working on our farms. You know, I'm a, a parent of an autistic person, a uh, child, grown, almost a grown-up. And, uh, you know, he was my, he was why I was driven to do this. I saw in him an outstanding farm worker, great powers of focus, repetitive tasks, no problem, doesn't lose, you know, can do it outdoors, a lot of energy required, even better. Um, and, and I was in desperate need of an alternative source of labor because of what was going on with my labor source. So you have to have a person like that who, you know, can bring it together and then won't drop it when they meet, you know, the first roadblock or the second or the third. And it was the same with building the agricultural investment program. So, you know, I, that's an organic thing. It doesn't happen everywhere. But I will tell you that even in an organization like TI Craft, completely mission-driven, not-for-profit, for the greater good, the academics, the whole nine yards, it still took 10 years. <laughs> great, great summary. All right, so um, I'm going to toss the, the hot potato to Michael to ask you to kind of summarize all this in a minute for us, and, um, and, then, and then we'll close. Yeah, I think what's uh, so interesting is what I observed as well in the past, that many innovations come from outside this country. Be it better regulation in Europe, be it Bangladesh, whatever it is, I found it always amazing that we have so many global corporations in this country, the city banks of the world, and you have the knowledge internally, and you have the feelers out, and you could do much more, but it's so incredibly hard to do it internally. Exactly what you described, Heather. So that's, I think, one operation, one observation. The second one is, if you think about strategy and innovation, you can do it to attack 
or to defend yourself. Right, so attackers are usually the smaller companies, the startups to do it, and you got the big players like the Mastercards, who in a certain way are defending the turfs against against new players. You know, not to be arbitraged out, but either way, we have to think about how to innovate. And um, one word about financial institutions: that's the first outthinker event we're doing, just for financial institutions. Well, why is that? Because if you look back. The industry has not a good rap about innovation. A private bank today looks pretty much the same as 150 years ago. And there are people out like Paul Falker who would say, since the ATM, nothing ever has happened in the space. But it's clearly not true. Because what you can observe is a lot of things are happening, but it may not be visible yet. When Kyle and I did a big event for a private bank a few weeks ago, uh, the bank was surprised about the innovation that's going on. And uh, just one example, today was all about one strategy, doing good. But doing good may not be enough. You need different strategies as well. All of them partnered somehow with somebody else. So how do you coordinate what's around you? How do you look about the next space that's coming up? So going back to the private banking example, you have now software companies that can arbitrage you out. that use the same technology like a private banker would do but for 10 basis points. And these are companies backed by Nobel Prize laureates and so on, and they're going after the next market. They're going after the next fight, a younger generation that doesn't care about personal touch and just cares about results. So how does a private bank react to that? So how do you find the next fighting space? So you don't fight for today, you find for tomorrow. So just a few examples that the space financial institutions is absolutely fascinating. And uh, we hope to have more events like the one today to look at other strategies as well, because that's one, but not the only one that we can pursue. So a big thank you to all the panelists. And uh, yeah. and just on your seats, you found uh, two sheets about OutThinker, what we do in the space. Uh, as you know, Kyan has developed a fantastic methodology. And basically, I think we have a very efficient and effective process, be it a corporate event you do for your high-level employees, be it a one-day thing, be it a five-time session to be innovative, be it during strategic planning process when some units, be it a corporate unit or a business unit, needs help. We're definitely here to help you and to discover your strength because in, in our experience, your employees actually know quite a bit. And with the right process, we believe you can harvest that knowledge, be it in the States or be it outside, and get to innovation like what we heard here today. So thanks a lot. And uh, yeah. I don't think we're going to get kicked out immediately. So if you'd like to hang out and have a little more coffee, it'd be great, mingle. And then we'll um, ask you, if you don't mind, uh, give us a little bit of feedback so we can make the next Outmaker session even better. And we have little gifts for you guys. We think that there are 36 patterns. We've talked about one. Michael's mentioned two more. We think there are 36. We have a deck of cards with uh, 36 uh, patterns for each of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.